Hi, this is Matt McCormick. I'm in the philosophy department at California State University, Sacramento. This is my second lecture on expected value theory for my uh, Phil 61 uh, inductive logic class. All right, so we've got a lot of stuff to go through here today. Um, stay with me. We can do um, the videos useful because you can pause and go back and check details. We're going to do a lot of problems and a lot of concepts. Okay, so our expected value theorem that we learned about in the last lecture is this idea that imagine we let A be an action with a set of utility outcomes. Suppose B, C, D, E through N could possibly result as an as a outcome of doing A. Um, and we can attach a probability to each one of those. So there's a probability that B will happen, a probability that C will happen, a probability that D will happen, and so on. Um, so the formula says the expected value of action A equals the weighted average of those probabilities times those outcomes. And here it is instantiated one more time for a bunch of outcomes uh, B through N. Lots of ways to do this. You'll see lots of examples today. Um, I'm mostly going to do examples where we just have two possible outcomes. That is, um, one or the other thing happens and the total probabilities add up to one because they're two mutually, mutually exclusive outcomes. All right, so here's what we're thinking about. Here's, here's, the, here's what's happening is we're giving a mathematical model for something that we sort of do intuitively. We're going to formalize it. So here you are in the moment. You're in the now making a decision. You're trying to decide whether I should do A or B. And the future is uncertain. You don't know what might result. So. Um, those outcomes in the future, they have probabilities and they also have utilities. Utility, again, is the, is the concept we're using to measure whatever it is we value. So they've got lots of examples of money cases, but we might value other things. You might value time, you might value uh, pleasure, whatever. We just need to put a number on it and then we can um, plug it into the formula. So imagine you're faced with a choice to either A, park illegally, which would have one of two outcomes. You'd either get a ticket or you wouldn't get a ticket. And then suppose we attach some probabilities to those. So maybe you make an estimate that the probability of your getting a ticket is 0.1, 10%. And the cost of a ticket in this particular example is 52 bucks. So that means then that the probability of not getting a ticket is, is 0.9 and the utility of not getting a ticket is zero. Uh, you might consider, you might want to add in some other utilities there. You might add in the smug self-satisfaction of beating the system or of getting your coffee a bit faster. Or you might be tempted to say that you saved $1.50 because you didn't put it in the meter here. But that'd be a mistake. Actually, the utility of the outcome where you don't get a ticket is just status quo. Your wallet stayed the same. You didn't get anything, you didn't lose anything in that case. Whereas if you were to make decision B, that is pay the meter, then the outcome is that you pay $1.50. And the probability for now, we'll just attach a, a one, a certainty onto that. So the utility in this case is minus $1.50. Um, so now you're faced with two choices, A or B, and they've got those various probabilities attached to their outcomes. So let's consider then uh, the expected value of action A equals the weighted average. So 10% of minus $52 or 90% of zero, which works out to be minus 520. So what does that mean? Well, that means that, uh, I mean, one way to think of it is that were I to, pl to, to gamble this way or to play or make this decision over and over and over again with my probabilities at that rate, and my utilities at that rate, then on average, this kind of decision, were I to make it hundreds or thousands of times, this kind of a decision would work out to cost me $5.20 per case. Most of the time, I wouldn't get a ticket. Sometimes I would get a ticket, and that's discounted to 10%. So each one of these cases is 520. Whereas the expected value of uh, choice B, uh, paying the meter, is $1.50. So the way this pans out then is that um, minus 520 is less or worse than minus $1.50. And that's to say the expected value of action A is uh, less or worse than the expected value of action B. Therefore, in this particular case, you ought to choose B 
because uh, you'll be ahead by more things you value, and in this case, it's dollars. You will have, um, you will lose fewer dollars, or you will have more dollars in your pocket as a result of choosing B. On average, were you to act this way in lots of cases. All right, so there's our formula, and uh, the concept is, uh, what's the expected value of a choice? It's the weighted average of the probabilities and the utilities of its outcomes. That's the way to understand it in English. It's a simple idea, but it can conflict with our ordinary intuitions about value or about outcomes. Uh, for example, often when we're thinking about outcomes, we just think about the utilities. We get distracted by the, you know, the jackpot, like a, like a million dollar lottery jackpot without proportioning to the probabilities uh, in the case. That is, you might be thinking about that pile of money, but the chance of getting that pile of money is only one in 17 million, which when we do the expected value calculation means that, that the, the expected value of that lottery ticket is, is uh, five cents, minus five cents. So what you just did is you paid a dollar for a lottery ticket that's actually worth five cents. Um, so uh, the expected value sometimes gives us very different uh, outcomes or different recommendations from, from uh, what we normally do. All right, um, what about, let's, uh, here's what I wanna do here is think about uh, adopting expected value as a decision policy. And this is an idea that's in Kahneman actually, where Kahneman says, well, look, you've got finite uh, cognitive resources. You've only got a limited amount of time and energy to devote to, 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 to lots of decisions. Um, maybe you could reason through this and then think of some good policy decisions that might in the long run pay off for you or, advan or, or give you an advantage. Um, so here's the question. What happens if you adopt this expected value approach in every circumstance where this kind of calculation applies? Imagine you were to do this kind of calculation in lots and lots of cases every day where um, uh, it might help. Uh, and here's the, here's the argument I want to make, is that what's going to happen is that in the long run, you're going to be hugely better off if you adopt the expected value theorem than if you don't. So Here's the argument. In the long term, even though you will sustain some losses, overall, if you adopt expected value, then you will get more utility. You will be better off if you use the expected value theorem. Uh, why? Uh, I'll show you in a second. Now, uh, we considered a, an example of somebody who might be looking at a big payoff last time and we thought about this objection. And somebody might say, but for lots of my decisions, I'm not able to face the same odds and the same utilities over and over again to achieve this long-term result. Lots of my decisions are unique or singular opportunities. You know, somebody might say, well, look, um, I'm never actually making that same parking permit decision. Um, the odds are always shifting or things are always different. Um, or I don't get this opportunity to do something hundreds or thousands of times where I start getting the benefits of this long-term averaging. Um, and the answer here is that it doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter even if all of your decisions are unique or singular, um, if we aggregate all of those different decisions. Um, here's what happens. Imagine being given a choice between decision set A, where you made a thousand unique decisions, each with an expected value payout where you chose the suboptimal option and decision set B where for the same thousand unique decisions you chose the expected value option that maximized utility. Should you choose A or B? And here's what I mean is imagine a hundred or a thousand decisions that are stretching out in front of you in your life for the next six months or the next week or whatever. Now imagine that you um, made all of those choices inconsistent with the expected value calculation, or imagine the other future where you made them all consistent with the expected value calculation. So, you know, think of it like this, that on Sunday you made a choice, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, on all of those days you had a choice between A or B. And the way I've set this up is that choice A in every one of these cases has got just a fixed value. We can imagine that it has an expected value that or you just look at some choice and you make it. So you buy a toaster um, or you buy a microwave oven for 90 bucks. And then on Monday, you buy uh, a cup of coffee for $3. And then on Tuesday, you pay for the insurance on a laptop that you bought and, and so on and so forth. Imagine all these cases where you make choices that cost you money or cost you uh, hours. And 
this argument is going to work not just for places where it costs you money, but for cases where you gain money. But I'm just trying to simplify for the moment. So imagine a set of choices A, which is our first column, our first row across the chart. And at the end of the week, then you've spent $203 and you've used up four hours. And imagine if you adopted choice B in every one of those cases where you did what expected value told you to do and expected value gave you a slightly better option. So in all those cases, at the end of the week, you spent $171.59 and you used up um, 3.3 uh, 3 hours. So the net here is that over the course of the week, you're now ahead by $31.41 or you're ahead by 7 tenths of an hour. That is, you, you've got more money in your pocket and more hours um, to spend as a result of aggregating your decisions according to the expected value uh, uh, utility or expected value calculus. Consider the accumulated effects of making lots of choices this way every day. Over time, the utility, the money, the time, the things you value, they all add up. And then future you, the person who's the, who's the recipient of all these choices, is much better off. Um, and then even go even further, multiply this outcome by 52 weeks in a year, and then multiply that by 20 years. Imagine you adopted the expected value theorem for 20 years. At the end of 20 years, in my, in my really oversimplified, you know, simple little example, you're now ahead by $32,000 and 728 hours. So in effect, what, uh, what hacking and what Kahneman and what, I are, what I'm suggesting to you here is, is, is I'm offering you $32,000 and I'm offering you 728 free hours. And what, what do you have to do to get it? You have to adopt this policy. You adopt this policy, policy for making your decisions and future you gets all of that. It's very diffuse and it's very abstract and it's very distant. It's 20 years away, but hey, 20 years that 20 years out, future you is going to be hugely uh, uh, grateful to present you who made this decision that put all that extra money in their pocket. I mean, imagine if you started investing that money and then you get returns on your investment in the stock market, you turn that thirty-two thousand dollars into you know half a million dollars, and now future you is really happy about the choice you made. Uh, okay, so enough for my pitch for the argument uh, for what you ought to do. Let's consider some more examples. So um, I'm going to give you a bunch of cases, a bunch of, of, of examples where we can apply the theorem and see what the expected value uh, answer is uh, to a particular game, for instance. And games and gambles are always really good because they give us some kind of fixed probabilities and fixed outcomes so we can kind of give us clean, simplified, idealized uh, example that will make the... Um, uh, the output of the expected value theorem really clear. So how about um, I'm going to roll a six-sided die and I'll give you a dollar for a one, two dollars for a two, three dollars for a three, four dollars for a four, and so on. What's the expected value of this game for you? Okay, so the expected value then is the weighted average of all the possible outcomes, um, their probabilities, and their utilities. So when we calculate the outcomes and the odds, we get this formula. That is, um, where's that 0.16 coming from? Well, it's a six-sided die, so it's a one-sixth chance of getting a dollar, uh, a 0.16 chance of getting two dollars, a 0.16 chance of getting three dollars, and so on. Um, you run the numbers on that, you run all the math, you get uh, 350. That is, were you to play this game, on average, you'd pick up three dollars and fifty cents per round. That's a good game. That's a that's a that's a really. If somebody offers to play this game, you ought to play it, right? Because there's no way for you to lose. Even if you get a one, you get a dollar, and you might get a six. So you get six bucks. So the, this is a this is an awesome game. Play it. Uh, suppose I ask you now to pay three dollars to play this game. Now should you play the game? I mean, for free, you should definitely play this game. Now, what if I ask you to pay $3? Well, we sh we've shown that the expected value of this game is $3.50. So if I was to pay $3 each time I played, what would happen over the long term? Over the long term, I'd be coming out ahead 50 cents per round. So now the benefit's not as great, but I'd definitely be coming out ahead. Now, sometimes I, I would... Um, Sometimes I would pay $3 to play and I would only get a dollar for winning or $2 for winning. And those particular cases would look bad. I'd go, well, look, I'm down two bucks now or I'm down a dollar now. 
But of course, there's going to be lots of cases where you get $3 and you break even or four or five or six, and that's where you come out ahead. And here we're playing the long numbers. We're playing the aggregation. We're looking at the decision policy over the long term. So this is a good game. It's still a good game. You should play it. You're ahead by 50 cents each time. Um, okay, so another new concept. Um, if you're about to make a decision to play the dice game or something else, um, should the calculation you're making take any account of what you've done in the past? And the answer here is expected value takes no account of the past. It doesn't matter what, for example, you paid for your laptop or your lottery ticket. All that matters is its current value and the proposal on the table. Uh, so here's what I mean. Um, here's the sunk cost fallacy. The sunk cost fallacy is the mistake of letting non-recoverable costs and this is the crucial point, non-recoverable costs from the past influence your decisions about the future. Okay, so I'll give you some examples. Um, imagine you're looking at this dinner in front of you. This dinner was really expensive um, and you feel tempted to eat the whole thing, right? Because you paid so much money for it. Or I need to get my money's worth out of this ticket for the basketball game, even though I'm feeling sick. Or maybe you got a case where uh, since we already bought the tickets for this movie, we should just sit through the rest of it, even though it's awful. Um, or any other case, like a crappy job. Um, I've put a lot of time or energy or resources into this project, so I don't want to waste all of that and walk away now. Okay, those are all sunk cost situations. And they're situations where I'm suggesting and where the expected value theorem is suggesting you should walk away. In cases where past losses or gains are not recoverable, this behavior is an irrational allocation of current resources. I mean, look at the dinner case, right? Um, if, you, if they brought out uh, your meal and suppose you eat part of it and you're full now, you don't really want any more, you're full, you, you're, you're satisfied, um, how much is that meal going to cost? Are they going to charge you part of it if you only finish part of your plate? No, they're going to charge you the same amount whether you eat the whole thing or not. So there's no reason to push through it. And the same thing for the basketball game, right? Suppose you come to the basketball game, you watch a quarter, you watch a half, and now you feel sick. Well, are you going to go out to the door and they're going to give you half your money back? No, they're not going to give you half your money back. The money for the ticket's already gone. So that's sunk cost. It's vanished. Now is now. And right now I'm feeling sick. So now I leave. Now I walk out. And the same thing for movies. Um, now, in all of these cases, though, if it's possible to get some of your money back, then maybe you should, right? Uh, with the movie case, I don't know if they have rules about this at the theater, but in the movie case, maybe if the movie sucks, maybe you should ask for your money back and you get it back, and you're even better off in that case. Okay, so sunk cost doesn't pay any attention, or sorry, expected value doesn't pay any attention to sunk cost. All right, so how about this instance? Um, somebody tells you, look, I bought this, uh, this lottery ticket. It's a Girl Scout raffle ticket. I paid a dollar for it. And they, they, they sold 100 tickets, and the winner's going to get 90 bucks. What will you give me for it? Um, so the expected value for this ticket is there's a 1 in 100 chance of getting 90 bucks and a 99% chance of getting zero. So this ticket's worth 90 cents right now. So suppose I say, okay, I did the expected value calculation on it. I'll give you 90 cents for it. The guy who bought it says, hey, but that's not fair. I paid a dollar for it. Hey, look, sorry, that's not worth a dollar. If I give you 90 cents, I won't be ahead or behind a penny. I'll give, be giving you exactly what it's worth. The past is gone. Um, that's sunk cost, that dollar you paid for it. But 90 cents for me, that would be a wash. That would be the even zero threshold. Um, so expected value lets us identify that zero threshold where there's neither a loss nor a gain, and that's exactly its value in this particular case. Um, okay, so here's another sort of uh, uh, related concept, and I, I want to tie this into sort of the general neurobiological and evolutionary account that I've been giving to these capacities all semester long. Um, here's a really great passage from a book uh, by Steven Pinker. He says, the sand hunter-gatherers of the Kalahari Desert engage in the oldest form of the chase. It's called persistence hunting, in which humans, with their unique ability to dump heat through, sweet, to, through sweat slick skin, pursue a furry mammal in the midday sun until it collapses of heat stroke. Since most mammals are swifter than humans and dart out of sight as soon as they're spotted, persistence hunters track them by following their spore, which means inferring the animal's species, sex, age, and level of fatigue, and thus its likely direction of flight from the hoof prints, bent stems, and displaced pebbles left behind. 
The SAM do not just engage in inference, deducing, for example, what agile springboks tread, that agile springboks tread deeply with pointed hooves to get a good, good grip, whereas heavy kudus tread flat-footed to support their weight. They also engage in reasoning, articulating the logic behind their inferences to persuade their companions or be persuaded in their turn. Okay, so why have I added this in here? Well, um, a large part of the uh, development, the evolutionary um, uh, unfolding of our cognitive faculties, our reasoning procedures, uh, evolved in circumstances very much like what these uh, hunters in Africa are doing. That is, the evolutionary pressures that were on us that built our cognitive faculties were those sorts of pressures, where we were chasing, reasoning, arguing with each other, trying to figure out um, where the, 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 our game went or what the best way to proceed is when we've got unknown probabilities about the future, about where we're arguing about whether it's more probable that the, um, the springbok went that way or more probable the springbok went that way. And we know the utilities of catching the springbok, springbok versus um, the disutility of us spending all day running and chasing after the thing, right? So uh, evolution actually equipped us with, a, with a, a pretty remarkable set of cognitive skills or abilities here for sort of sussing out what the intuitive expected value of these kinds of decisions were. You know, we all have in intuitions about uh, how much further should I pursue this? How much harder should I keep working on this problem? And we have kind of intuitions about quitting or about uh, pursuing or keeping going. And the idea here is that the, by formalizing the expected value calculation and modeling it mathematically, and now we're formally attaching probabilities and utilities to it, we can make that whole um, set of, of reasoning decisions much more explicit and we can articulate and develop a policy here that'll make better decisions and we can you know, improve our performance at it rather than just having this be in what's, what... Um, Kahneman would have called a system one decision, right? System one normally just de delivers a set of intuitions or feelings or kind of um, uh, inarticulated uh, uh, suspicions about what's true. Whereas by moving it out to this formalized model, now we can make, use system two on it and really um, elaborate and explain and examine what's going on. Um, so that's how this thing whole connects back to this neurobiological and evolutionary account that I've been giving um, to our cognitive faculties all semester. Okay, so your cognitive neural system evolved more or less to produce expected value calculations, uh, to build probabilistic representations of objects in the world and their behavior, and those objects have various degrees of utility for you. That's what's happening when you're chasing after a gazelle um, or you're trying to get your dinner for the evening. Um, some of the things you're going after are things you can eat. Some of them will eat you. Some will try to kill you. Some you can have sex with. Some will try to have sex with you. Some you need to cooperate with and some you will try to get their cooperation. So there's a lot of complicated probability and utility decisions here that you're making um, that can be formalized in this, uh, with this uh, theorem. But our intuitive system, system one, those estimations of expected value are usually hasty, they're error prone, they're limited in scope, and the inner workings of most of what's going on in our heads are hidden from our view. Uh, but not now if we've got this uh, formal model in front of us that we're examining. Um, and that's the, the shorter version of this uh, theorem that we're using in these sorts of problems. Okay, so how about this game? It's a much simpler example. Uh, we're gonna flip a coin if it comes up heads, I'll give you $15. If it's tails, you give me $10. Uh, what's the expected value in dollars of this game for you? Well, there's two outcomes. You're either going to win or lose. The expected value of winning is 50%, is, uh, so the expected value of winning is 0.5 times 15. The expected value of losing is 0.5 times minus 10. So the overall expected value of the game combines those two to give you a net plus of 250. That's again, that's a good game. You should play that game if you get a chance. Um, okay, how about this one? You're trying to decide whether to buy a lottery ticket. The tickets cost $5. There's a thousand tickets that are going to be sold and one will be randomly drawn as the winner. The prize is $1,000. What's the expected value of buying one of these lottery tickets? Okay, so the two possible outcomes are that you win or you don't win and that's a one in a thousand chance or a 999 chance you lose. 
The utility of purchasing the ticket and winning is $1,000 minus $5. Why? Well, the ticket cost you five. So your net there uh, in the winning case is $995. The utility of purchasing the ticket and losing is you're just out five bucks. You didn't get any benefit there. Hence, the expected value for buying the ticket is this. The ticket is um, all of those added together, right? The 1% chance at 995, the nine, the, the 0.999 chance at minus five, um, do the multiplication and then uh, add those together, you get minus $4. So that means overall, this lottery ticket, folding in the $5 value, this lottery ticket is a negative $4. Now, there could be other advantages, other utilities that somebody might derive from playing the lottery. I mean, maybe this is for a church uh, lottery and they're gonna use the money to uh, build a, a shelter, build homes for the homeless. So now you're not just getting the possible chance at the $995 payoff, but you're also doing some good in the world. Your $4 went to um, shelter the homeless or whatever. Uh, or you, maybe you just feel good, or you feel some pleasure, um, feel some self-satisfaction at doing some good in the world or donating to a good charity. So those are, all, those are all utilities. And if we were doing a more elaborate or a more detailed account, we'd sort of write those in somehow. We would build all those in as, as advantages. But in this kind of simple rarefied case where we're just considering money as utility and we're only looking at money out and money in, then this thing is just a money, uh, a money out proposition. It's a minus four dollar uh, game. Okay, how about, um, here's another important concept we need to add in. I want to start talking about insurance. Um, at what level or at what rates is insurance worth it? So suppose you bought a sculpture, an ugly sculpture, while you're touring South America for five thousand dollars and you're going to ship it home and you've got a chance to buy uh, insurance for it. If the price reflects its value, and the probability of its being lost or destroyed is 5%, what price below is closest to the fair price to the policy? And here's what I mean. Um, a fair price for the insurance is the one in which both the insurer and the insured receive something of equal value. That is, what you want is a policy that covers you against the risk of not having insurance, which is a 5% chance of losing $5,000, if X equals the value of the policy and L means the, the artwork is lost, then we get this formula. So here's the expected value of no insurance. If I don't get any insurance, then what am I looking at? Well, there's a 95% chance that nothing bad will happen, but there's a 5% chance that I'm now out $5,000. I lost the, uh, the sculpture. So 5% of, of minus $5,000 is minus 250. So the expected value of the choice to choose to not get insurance is minus 250. So that means that um, the, the, the value, the fair value of an insurance policy would be, setting, uh, that would be set equal to that number. If we set these two values equal to each other, then X will give us the fair price, right? So insurance, um, if insurance costs uh, 250, then I break even. If the insurance costs more than 250, now I'm actually losing money, right? Because the risk I was facing was minus 250, and suppose I paid $300 for the insurance, well, now I've done even worse than I would have done just by going with no insurance. But suppose that the insurance policy costs $200, and so now I'm actually ahead. Um, I've gained something. So the, the zero threshold value here, the fair price of insurance, is just where we set it equal to zero. And in this case, since the risk is 5%, that's just 250. Anything more or anything, more, anything less puts us into um, a different answer about the value of the insurance. Okay, so how about this example, this case? You and your brother are buying laptops. The laptop costs $1,000. Fry's offers you an insurance policy for one year at the checkout that costs 75 bucks. Your brother lives in a sketchy neighborhood and there's a 10% chance his will get stolen in the next year. Your neighborhood isn't so bad, so maybe the chance of yours getting stolen is only 5%. Is the insurance policy a better than fair price for either of you? Should either of you get this insurance? An expected value will let us do that. Here's the calculation. So the laptop is 1,000. The probability of getting it stolen for your brother is 10%. The probability of getting it stolen for you is 5%. So 
So the choice is between insurance or no insurance. What's the expected value of going with no insurance? What happens if I don't get insurance? So if your brother, if he doesn't get insurance, he's looking at a 10% chance of losing $1,000. Um, and that should be a 90% a chance of zero gain. So uh, the expected value of no insurance for your brother, the net is minus 100. Whereas for you, the expected value of no insurance is a 5% chance of losing $1,000, which is only minus 50. And that also should be 0.9, not 0.95. Okay, so no insurance for the two of you is different. The expected value of that choice is different for you because your probabilities are different. His neighborhood is worse than yours, so he stands a higher chance of losing something or he's going he's to lose more as a result. So that means that since the insurance is, is only $75, your brother would be doing well to get it, right? It's a better deal for your brother to get the insurance policy than for you to get it because he's looking at a $100 risk, insurance only $75, but for you, you're only looking at a $50 risk, so paying $75 for insurance is paying too much. Um, so he would make $25 by taking that insurance policy, and you would lose $25 by taking that insurance policy. Okay, how about this example? Martin sells hot dogs from a, hot, from a stand on the street without a permit. He makes $300 a day selling the hot dogs. His costs are $100, so he'll make a net of $200 a day. The fine for illegal vending is $100. And suppose the chance of getting the ticket is 40%. What's the expected value of working for a day for Martin? So here's the calculation. The expected value of working is a 60% chance of netting 200 um, and a 40% chance of netting 200 minus 100. How do we get those numbers? Well, if he doesn't get a ticket, he's going to make $200 a day. But if he does get a ticket, he makes his $200 and then he has to pay $100 for the ticket. And there's a 40% chance of that. So the net um, expected value of working for a day for Martin is the aggregated um, weighted, uh, um, the weighted average of those numbers, which is uh, uh, 160. Uh, so it's a good proposition for Martin. He can still make some money there. Uh, how about this example? You need to keep your grades up to get $6,000 financial aid package next semester, and you got to pass your class in order to get your financial aid. Suppose if you take Randy Mays' inductive logic class, there's an 80% chance you'll pass and you'll learn something. And for the time being, I'm going to attach that value for, of learning something. I'm going to call it 10, and I'll say something more about that in a minute. But let's suppose you're going to learn 10, 10 units. Uh, whereas if you take McCormick's inductive logic class, there's a 60% chance you'll pass because he's stingier with the grades and you'll learn a lot more uh, from him because he's a much better teacher. The utility there is 500. You're ahead by 500. Which class should you take? So run the expected value for both examples. Uh, the expected value for taking Mays' class is um, plugging in the values, 80% chance at 6,000 plus 10. Where am I getting that? Well, the 6,000 is the financial aid you get next semester by passing, and the 10 is the amount you learn. And in the case that you don't pass, you neither get the financial aid nor do you get the learn, so you get zero. That's that status quo thing happening again. It's not that your wallet changed in that case. It's not that you lost any money. Um, you just ended up the same, so you've got a zero for that case. But the expected value for McCormick's case uh, works out to be 3900 So given those numbers, when we plug in the values, what should you do? You should definitely take Mays' class. It's, uh, uh, you stand to gain a lot more. Uh, you got a much better shot at the financial aid, even though you learn a lot more from McCormick. Okay, so that raises a really good question. Um, are learns, quote unquote, fungible to dollars? I've done, I've done something sneaky right there. I've just uh, plugged in dollars and learns into the same equation. I put the utility of learning from McCormick at 500. Um, so what is that 500 of what? Is that dollars? Did you get $500 from him by taking the class? Um, obviously not. So what's a learn? A learn is a thing that you value. It's a thing that you place some utility on. So maybe it's a bit of pleasure, it's power, it's knowledge, it's competence, it's maturity. I don't know. It's something. Um, it's something that we do place some value on. And if we can do this, if we can find some way to put um, 
some things that we, some intangible things that we put some value on, if we can attach a number to those and somehow get them into the same equation with the dollars, we can do some really useful um, comparisons here. And in fact, you already do this. You do translate or you, you know, make this fungible uh, transition from learning to dollars. Uh, you're in college because you figure the investment of dollars will pay off in dollars, among other things. Um, you're translating your tuition dollars, hopefully, into learning some things. And then you're hoping that, that by learning those things that you go out into the world and the education of the knowledge then uh, brings money back. So you're moving money into a different kind of value and then back out into money value. Um, so this has been a standing problem in decision theory to answer this question. How can you find out how much utility does someone place on something? And one of the really obvious easy things to do is to say, well, let's see how many dollars they'll trade for it, right? If I offer you money, um, you know, will you take this, take this risk on or will you play this game? Um, and if we find the, th th the threshold where you change your mind from saying no to saying yes, now we found your value, your utility in dollars. Um, okay, so that leads me to the next sort of interesting case here. Um, imagine that you're thinking about driving in the carpool lane illegally and that there's a... Uh, <clears throat> $270, $71 fine for uh, getting caught. Suppose that you value the advantage of going faster in the car lane illegally and not getting caught at $5. Now, I don't know how to, uh, how to evaluate this. Um, if they had a special toll lane that was open for $5, would you pay for that? Uh, you probably wouldn't. I don't know. Um, it might depend. Maybe it depends on whether you're rushing somebody to the hospital who's about to have a baby. Um, maybe you're trying to get to a job interview where you absolutely can't be late. Um, you know, you would attach different values or different utilities to being in the carpool lane illegally, depending on what the circumstances was, uh, circumstances were. So let's just, for the sake of argument, let's just say that that value is five dollars. Now, if you want to change it, that's fine. It just gives us some different numbers here when we run the math. But now that we got the numbers, we can answer some interesting questions. What's the probability? What does the probability of getting caught have to be in order to make it worth it to cheat the carpool lane? What's the fair price of getting caught? So here's what we've done. Um, we're asking, what's the expected value of using the carpool lane illegally? Um, and we're trying to figure out uh, the probabilities here. So I'm going to plug in X for the probability of getting a ticket and 1 minus X for the probability of um, this advantage, this $5 advantage of not getting a ticket. So we're just going to solve now for the probabilities instead of having them on the other side of the equation. And we've already done several cases like this before uh, this semester. And here's the idea. Is, the idea is that we're looking for the zero threshold. If I set that equation equal to zero, what I'm going to find, and then I solve for x, is what I'm going to find is this is the point where you're neither gaining nor losing any dollars. This is the threshold. Given that probability, this is the place where it's worth exactly $5 to you and you're neither gaining nor losing. Okay, so take that equation and set it equal to zero and then solve for x. So I distribute um, and I combine like terms there. So I get um, zero equals minus 276x plus five. Um, now I move minus 276x to the left-hand side by subtracting, or sorry, adding that to both sides. And now I'm going to divide um, 5 by 276 to get to figure out what x is. And it works out that x is 0 0.018. Um, what does that mean? Well, that means that the prob if the probability of getting caught is greater than 1.8%, then the expected value of cheating in the carpool lane starts turning negative. That means um, if, suppose the CHP is um, catching carpool lane cheaters at 5% or 10% rate. Um, that's, that would mean that uh, if they're, this calculation would come out to be negative in that, in that account because it's greater than, than um, uh, 2%, greater than 1.8%. Um, but suppose the CHP was only um, uh, catching 1% of the cheaters. Well, uh, that means you actually you'd be in the positive. You would do, there'd be a benefit here. So by setting this thing equal to zero, what we've done is we've solved the threshold of the exact value. Anything greater or anything less is going to 
change the expected value quotient for this thing. Um, but right now, the threshold or the probability of getting caught um, here, the, thresh, the fair, price, fair price threshold is 1.8%. Okay, so let's consider some other examples. How about this one? Suppose the CHP knows that at best they can only catch 4% of carpool lane violators. Suppose that CHP policymakers think that people place the value of using the carpool lane at $3. That is, if the expected value of carpool lane cheating is greater than $3, then they won't do it. Um, so how much should the fine be at least in order to deter people from using the carpool lane. Here's what we mean is, um, what's the expected value of cheating in the carpool lane? Um, so they know that they can catch people 4% of the time, which means 96% of the time they won't catch them. And that means 96% of the time people will be getting or gaining three. And that's what that three is there. So 96% of the time, the cheaters will evade capture and they will get $3 units of benefit. But 4% of the time, they're gonna get a fine. And we're trying to figure out what that fine should be. In particular, we wanna know what that fine should be, where the threshold is, where is the zero threshold? We wanna find the place where lawbreakers are neither gaining nor losing anything. So I'm gonna set this whole thing equal to zero and go ahead and multiply the terms. And now I can start calculating and moving terms around. So I move uh, 288 to the other side by subtracting from both sides. And then I divide both sides by 0.04 and I get minus 72. Okay, so what that means is if I put the, the fine at $72, if I make people who cheat um, pay $72, then now I've uh, found the exact zero threshold where um, given the benefit that they derive from cheating, um, that's the place where um, if, it, if the fine goes higher than that, they're going to start to be deterred if they're trying to uh, maximize the utility. And if the fine is lower than that, then they're going to be motivated to cheat. Um, so you can see again how that zero threshold or that sort of fair price question lets us figure out something important. And now the CHP can figure, okay, since we can only um, uh, catch 4% of the cheaters, then we just need to make the fine be $72 or more, and that will motivate them. If they're rational and if they're trying to maximize utility like we are, that'll motiv motivate them to not cheat the carpool lane. Okay, here's a simpler example. Um, one like we've already looked at a few cases. Uh, should you pay the meter or risk getting caught? Suppose you're looking at a choice. Uh, you're going to park in front of a restaurant downtown, and the meter is going to cost you $350, or the fine uh, for not paying the meter is going to be $4250, and even worse if you uh, wait on it too long. All right, so what should you do? Uh, suppose we estimate that the probability of getting caught is 5%. In monetary terms alone, how do these two choices compare? That is paying the meter or um, risking getting caught. So the expected value of paying the meter is 100% chance of being out 350. That is, you just pay 350. So it's minus 350. Whereas the expected value of not paying the meter means there's a 95% chance that nothing happens and a 5% chance you're out 4250. So 5% times 4250 equals minus $2 and, and 12 cents. Okay, so what does that tell me? The meter cost me 350. The expected value of cheating the meter cost me 212. So that means the expected value of the meter is worse um, than, than cheating. Cheating's a better deal. Um, on average, on the whole, I'm going to come out a uh, dollar or so, a uh, dollar thirty-seven ahead by cheating in these kinds of cases, if that in fact is what the probabilities are. Um, okay, so how about this case? This is even better. Um, I didn't know this till I went and looked it up. It turns out Rogaine is not very effective. Only 40% of men who use Rog Rogaine twice daily will experience some hair regrowth in, six, in three to six months. I went and got this off the package. Okay, so a one-year supply costs 65 bucks, and you have to keep you have to keep using it, or you lose the gains. That's that's also interesting here. So, so there's a number of disutilities attached to uh, to uh, using Rogaine. Um, so what's the expected value of Rogaine? Well, there's a probability I'll grow some hair, and then there's utility of having more hair minus the disutility of of having to use the stuff and pay for it. 
And then there's a probability that I, that I won't grow any new hair and I multiply that by the utility of uh, the downsides of not having any hair. So that in English, they're sort of halfway between the English and the expected value theorem. Um, there's what our equation looks like. So now we can start plugging in some values and figuring this thing out, right? So the expected value for row gain then is you've got a 40% chance that you're going to get um, some more hair. Now, how much is more hair worth to you? Um, that's a good question. We'll, we're going to ponder this in a minute. It's worth a lot to George Clooney. Um, what's the disutility of using it? Well, it's a pain to have to wash your hair with it twice a day. Um, and it's a pain to have to go to the store and get it special or go get the prescription or whatever. And plus, you've got to pay $65 a year. So I'm going to put all of those into the utility equation. There's the, there's the benefit of more hair, and there's a disutility of having to use it, and then there's the um, disutility of the money you have to spend on it. 40% um, chance of that. And then the other case, you're mostly just losing. That is 60% of the time, it doesn't work, and you're out 65 bucks. So now let me attach some values here. Suppose somebody, this is not George Clooney, suppose somebody values uh, some more hair at $100. And I don't know where to put this, it's gonna depend on you, uh, depend on what you think about it. And suppose somebody attaches the, the, a value of 25 to the disutility of having to use the stuff twice a day. And then there's the $65 you have to pay for it. So now we've got some numbers, we can figure out that the expected value for row gain in this case is minus 50. Not very good. Now, um, the numbers will work out different for somebody else, depending on how where we put, put these in. Um, what's the expected value of not using row gain? Um, is that a status quo case? Is that where you're just, your wallet stays the same, your head stays the same, there's no hair gained or lost? I don't know, maybe you've got um, profound anguish from being bald and that's a minus 20, or maybe it's a minus 1,000. Maybe being bald is really, really awful for you. Maybe it's a minus 1,000, in which case Rogaine is only a minus 50, so you should definitely do Rogaine in that case. But if you don't care, if you don't have any anguish over being bald, then Rogaine's not a good deal. Um, okay, so we actually figure out the threshold, and we'll use me uh, for the example. Since I don't really care about more hair, um, Rogaine's mostly a lose-lose proposition. Uh, even if it works, since I don't derive much utility from it, it's always negative, and I really don't want to have to use it twice a day. But there will be a positive value of more hair or a level of utility for more hair such that the expected value of Rogaine would be positive, and we can figure out what that is, right? We can use that equation that we just had to figure out the threshold. Uh, the expected value of Rogaine equals 40% of x minus 25 minus 65. So what am I? What are those numbers? So that's the $65 you have to pay for it, and the minus $25 is the hassle of having to wash your hair with it twice a day. Um, and now we want to set that number uh, equal to zero and solve for x. And that'll give us the fair value for more hair that would make, uh, uh, you know, above which Rogaine would be worth it. So solving for, uh, setting that whole thing equal to zero and solving for x gives us the answer of $225. Okay, so what that means is that if, um, it, it's hard to measure anguish or heartbreak or your feelings about your hair, more or less hair, but if I could put a dollar value on more hair at 225, if it meant that much to me, then, um, uh, or more, you know, suppose Reg Rogaine, more hair would be, uh, really fantastic for me. It would really benefit me, benefit me a lot more. Maybe suppose I was heartbroken by a thousand by not having any. Um, then, then the 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 benefit here would be would definitely outweigh the losses. Uh, so that's to say, uh, for George Clooney or for Brad Pitt, for whom more hair definitely translates to thousands or millions of dollars. Those guys have got a huge vested interest in keeping a full head of hair. I guess, um, you know, somebody else. Uh, some other actors have managed to pull it off and go bald, but there seems to be some research that suggests more hair, more hair helps. Uh, but I don't care, and it doesn't make any difference for my job, so it's definitely not worth 225 for me. But if it's worth a million dollars to you, then hey, you should do it for sure. Okay, so now uh, a, a last example that's uh, quite a bit more complicated, but it'll let us uh, understand um, some, one of the last sort of issues we've got to cover for expected value theorem. Uh, cases. So imagine you and your partner have two holiday party invitations. One of them's at Sac State and one's at Wells Fargo. 
and you're trying to decide which one to go to. And suppose that at the Wells Fargo party, there's a chance, a 30% chance, that some friends you really like will be there and you'll have a great time. And let's call a great time a plus 800. But there's a 40% chance that your partner's pompous boss will be there and he'll make you angry and miserable. Uh, so that's a minus 300. The food and the drinks will be awesome at the Wells Fargo, Fargo party. That'll be good either way. So let's call that a plus 200. Now, if you want to debate or put attach different numbers or different values to all of those, you know, that's totally fine. Um, that's a, that's one of the interesting things about expected value theorem is that we, we now, once you get some numbers on the table, then we can figure out what is it worth and where are the thresholds, but s establishing these values at, at these levels, we're going to try to figure out which party should you go to. Okay. That's the first party. Here's the second party at the CSUS party, a friend from work might be there. There's a 50% chance she's coming and she's always lots of fun. So that's a good time. That's a plus 200 but your ex-husband might be there, 60% chance he'll be there, which will inevitably lead to stress and a fight with your partner. That's a minus 650. You know, the end of those holiday parties where you go home and fight all night. Um, the food and drink at the party will be okay. It's just a plus 50. Now, which party should you go to? All right, we've got a complicated set of conditions, a complicated set of probabilities, complicated uh, utilities. So here's a way to think about it. Um, let's just isolate the Wells Fargo party first. So there's four different scenarios or outcomes at the Wells Fargo party. Um, you might have a great time and the pompous boss is there. You might not have a great time and the pompous boss is there. You might have a great time and there's no pompous boss, or you might have, you might not have a great time and no pompous boss. And so what I've done here in the first column is I've tried to capture those scenarios and then the probabilities. So we know from earlier in the semester that the compound probability of say the having a great time and your pompous boss being there, if the first is 0.3 and the second is 0.4, then you multiply those together to get a, a conjoint probability of those, those two independent events being 0.12. And I'm going to treat these as independent events. You might think that having a great time is dependent on whether or not your pompous boss is there. But in this particular case, I'm going to treat them as separate. So they're independent events. Great time is one event. Pompous boss is another. The combined probability of both of those happening is 0.12. Whereas the combined probabilities of the other three scenarios are 0 0.28, 0 0.18, and 0.42 when you multiply those through. Now, so those are all our probabilities for the four scenarios. Uh, the next column has got the utilities, and this is easy, right? You've got 800 minus 300 plus 200 and, and so on for all the different columns. And those are just the cases where you get some benefits, you get some disutilities, and you put them together. So now in the third column and the fifth column, we've got our probabilities and our utilities. And all you got to do to figure out the expected value of the Wells Fargo party is to plug all those into the equation, multiply the probabilities times the utilities, and we get a number of 320. So what's that mean? That means the expected value of the Wells Fargo party is 320. If somebody asks you, how good is the Wells Fargo party? You say, it's 320 good. Uh, 320 what? Uh, I don't know. 320 happy units, 320 hedons or something like that. Whatever the values are, the things that we're attaching value to, we're going to get 320 of them by going to that party. Okay, so now you do the same thing for the CSUS party. There's four scenarios. Your friend shows up and your ex, what was it, ex-husband shows up. Your friend does not show up and your ex-husband shows up. Your friend shows up and your ex doesn't show up or your friend doesn't show up and your ex doesn't show up. Four scenarios, um, four conjoint probabilities. So in the third column, we've got 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, and 0.2. Those are when we multiply those compound independent events together, we get those probabilities. And in the final column, we get our total utilities for each one of those scenarios. And notice that a couple of them are already negative. Um, and that already suggests that this whole thing is not going to be better party. Um, so when we take the values from the third column and the fifth column and we plug them into the expected value uh, theorem, we get an answer of the expected value of the CSUS party is minus 240. So if somebody asks you how good is that party, you say it's minus 240 good. 
which is not good at all. That's a shitty party. Um, 320 is way better than minus 240. Therefore, the expected value of Wells Fargo is much better than the expected value of the CSUS party. So you should definitely go to the Wells Fargo party. It's better by, what is that? It's 500. 500 of whatever it is we're summarizing. Okay, so let's summarize what we've done so far today in the second lecture. There's um, a version of our expected value theorem. That's how we plug in our utilities and our probabilities. And I gave you an argument that we should aggregate your decisions. You ought to adopt the expected value theorem as a policy in your life. Um, and what happens is if you do that is you win in the long run. You're ahead by happiness, ahead by pleasure, ahead by dollars, ahead by time saved, um, uh, because you're playing all the probabilities and the utilities to your advantage. We also talked about the sunk cost fallacy, and that's the mistake of letting non-recoverable costs or benefits from the past influence decisions about the future. Uh, the expected value theorem ignores sunk costs. It just calculates what is the pro what are the prospects now. It doesn't pay any attention to what we paid what we did in the past. Uh, a fair price in expected value calculations is the zero threshold where neither party makes nor loses anything. And we've looked at a bunch of those examples. And we've done some cases where we solve for a utility value by setting the equation equal to zero and solving, and the same for solving for a probability. So we can you know, play around with the math and we can um, identify all of the, the um, components here as variables and then solve. So one of the examples I gave you was for carpool lane cheating and we solve for the utility of a, uh, the disutility of a ticket. And another example I gave you was, um, let's see, that's for Rogaine. How good does Rogaine have to be given those disutilities in order for it to be uh, a positive value where you set the thing equal to zero? Okay, so that's it for our expected uh, value theorem lecture number two.